Um, hi everyone, uh, we are going to present our paper which is called uh, Towards Portable Map Renderers. Uh, oh, I forgot the first part, so it's MapLib RS Towards Portable Map Renderers. So the team uh, is composed of Maximilian Amann, which is a software engineer from Germany and also the founder of MapLib RS. Um, then we also have uh, Jens Ingensan and Bertil Chapri, which are two. Thank you. Two professors at the University of Applied Sciences of Western Switzerland, also called the HEIGVD. Uh, and then there's me, uh, and I also work uh, at the university. So being able to travel the world uh, in a seamless application was something quite groundbreaking in the 90s. But since then, um, it has evolved a lot, and it's become something ubiquitous in our daily lives. And um, uh, yeah, so, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, so uh, s even if it has evolved a lot, there is still a lot of improvement to be made, and in this presentation we'll try to show you what we've tried to do to improve the, the state of the art, but first I will quickly introduce our map, map rendering works. So um, we have tiling, uh, so the world is really big, and what we will do is we will split it into a grid of tiles and we will actually make multiple grid of tiles uh, for the different zoom levels with different levels of details. And um, um, we have different kind of type uh, of tiles. So we have the raster tile. A raster tile is basically an image. And what we'll do is we will map uh, this image onto the screen uh, pixel by pixel. But uh, as it's an image, if you zoom in, it will get uh, pixelated. On the other hand, we have the vector tile. So the vector, the vector is a geometry. For example, this square uh, is composed of four lines. And uh, the renderer will have to create an image from the geometry to display it on the screen. Uh, so the steps to create this image uh, is obviously first we will read the geometry. And then we will make a tessellation. A tessellation is also called a triangulation in most cases. The goal is to create a set of triangles from the polygon. And uh, this is required because the graphics APIs are optimized to work with triangles. Then uh, the result of this tessellation can be called a mesh. And we will give this mesh to the graphics API along with a shader, with shaders. A shader is a small program. Uh, and in our case, we use two, one to decide where to put the vertices of the, the triangles and another one to decide which color uh, each pixel should be. So why do we use vectors? So it's not only about uh, scaling up and scaling down without, without losing quality. Um, there are other, um, other good uh, benefits. So the, the main one is that we can dynamically change uh, the styling. Um, so as we are rendering uh, an image from a polygon, we can just do a new rendering with different colors. Uh, we can also change, the, for example, the language of the text. We could um, show or hide different layers. Uh, another benefit is that um, um, another benefit is that we can click on these geometries to show different metadata and also vector uh, is usually lighter uh, in, the, in size than the raster. Uh, the downside is that we have to do all this rendering and uh, it will use a lot of uh, GPU power, uh, especially if we want to render it in real time, uh, for example, 60 frames per second. So now let's talk about our paper. So we have focused on the portability of map uh, rendering. Uh, so what is portability? So portability is the ability for a code to run on any platform. And a, pl a platform comprises many elements. We have at the lowest level the CPU architecture. Uh, above that, we have the operating system, such as Windows, Mac, or Linux. And then we have different graphics uh, APIs, such as OpenGL, DirectX uh, on Windows, Metal, usually on Mac. 
And on top of that, in, in some cases, we will have a, an application each we, in which we will want to run our code. Uh, and so that could be a web browser such as Chrome, Firefox, or Safari. And uh, we will have um, to use different set of APIs. So what we've done is we've analyzed uh, 37 map renderers, and uh, we have analyzed their portability, and we've come up with this graph. So as you can see, um, uh, the major, uh, like we have many renderers which support uh, PC, web, and mobile, but when you try to group them together, uh, for example, mobile and PC is already less supported, and when it comes to web and PC, or web and mobile, uh, there is almost nothing. Uh, there is actually only one uh, which supports web and PC, and uh, it uses similar technologies as we will present uh, later. So the main takeaway is that none of the listed renderers is fully portable. And uh, the main issue is that, um, is that um, uh, companies or communities like MapLibre have to maintain um, different code bases. And this is a big issue because uh, it's almost double the work. Uh, you have to have two teams which do the development and they have to collaborate. Uh, and so it's more costly, and all of that will reduce the ability to innovate. And so now, uh, Max will present to you uh, MapLibre RS, which is the uh, map renderer uh, written in Rust, uh, which uh, I'll let him present. <laughs> yeah. All right, so thank you. Um, so the MapLibre renderer is basically where Portability meets performance. Did the wrong, wrong button? Okay. Um, so, first of all, there are multiple MapLibre projects, which you maybe know. There's, for example, MapLibre GL Native. There's also MapLibre GLJS. Um, and now there's MapLibre RS. Um, and all of these are distinct. So, MapLibre GL Native is the previous implementation which runs on native. It's written in C. And MapLibre GLJS is the implementation which currently runs or powers the browser. So um, the MapLibre RS project started basically out as a hobby project last year. Um, after release, it gained some traction. So MapLibre um, noticed that it's full or it's complying to their goals, um, and that way it started out as a playground for new technologies at MapLibre. Um, which then led to this collaboration with, so we joined forces with HEIG, um, and made this feasibility study, um, additionally to this, uh, review. Um, and the future is still unclear, which, um, I will talk later about. Um, so all of this is made possible by WebGPU, which is an upcoming, um, W3C draft or specification. Um, so it's a um, cross-platform 3D graphics API, which you can use in a browser. Um, the cool thing is you can also use it on native, on desktop, or on mobile, because there's a corresponding implementation for it. Um, and it's basically the successor to WebGL. Um, it's modern and portable, like I just said, and we kind of expect it to stabilize in 2024, 2026. Um, at least that's roughly the time frame which WebGL took to stabilize. Could be way more. It could also be that it never happens. It will never come. Um, but we, we don't know. At least the specification is there and this is already a huge step. Um, and we believe it will be the future. Um, so any WebGPU application is basically structured like this. So you have an application on top. Um, you target it against the specification, the specification web GPU, um, and below that, you're reaching all of those um, graphics APIs, for example, Vulkan, Metal, DirectX, OpenGL, and so on. Um, and below that, you're eventually reaching the OS drivers and the graphics cards. So why Rust? Um, so it's written in Rust, um, and the main reason for this is because Rust is a systems programming language alternative to C++. Basically, we could also have been using use C++, um, but C++ makes our development easier. Um, so 
Rust makes it easy to run a browser. It makes multi-threading easy. Um, and there's also an implementation available in Rust, which targets or which implements um, WebGPU. So this is just easing, easing our development, basically. Um, so in order to explain why WebGPU is so great, I want to give a brief history. So there's, um, there's been a lot of graphics APIs over the past 20 years. There's, for example, OpenGL. There's also um, WebGL, which later came up. And WebGL2, all of these are classical flavored graphics APIs, how we call them. So it's all of them have roughly the same API. Um, and then there are the modern flavored graphics APIs. For example, Apple's Metal, um, DirectX, Vulkan, and WebGPU. Um, and all of these have a different style of API um, and have a more modern style of API, which, for example, benefits um, mobile GPUs especially. So... With a portable, portable map render, you basically have this goal of wanting to reach any device, any platform. Um, but there's a problem. If you want to support any device, then you also have to support all of the graphics API, which you've just seen um, on the previous slide. Um, and WebGPU is basically the solution to that. Um, there are other ways to support all of these. But the difference is this, that WebGPU is basically this designed um, to support all of these. So it's a specification which where portability is not an afterthought, but it's the initial idea, idea of the specification. Um, so that's how the map renderer looks right now. Um, as you can see, um, text rendering is still missing because it's hard. Um, I think everyone heard this maybe already once or twice. Um, but we already have some, some ideas how to do it and it will be like the next step. And yeah, that, that's Florence. Um, so we already solved quite a few challenges. So we have build automation for all of the platforms. So iOS, Android, and the web. Um, and we package libraries for all of these targets. So you can easily include it in your NPM project. You can include it in your Swift project. Uh, you can include it in your Android project. Yeah. Um, so we have, as you just seen, we have simple vector tile tessellation and styling. Um, we also, because we're multi-platform, we're also supporting the servers, of course. So you can, so if your server has a GPU, you can um, render tiles on the server. If it doesn't have a GPU, you can still render them, but then it will fall back to the CPU. Um, so we also have portable networking. So networking wor works differently in a browser and a native. In the browser, we can use the browser APIs. In a native, we have our own stack. Um, and multi-threading works across all platforms as well, so also on the browser and on native. So what we're currently working on is raster type support. Uh, we're working on glyph rendering and text shaping, which are two different challenges, um, equally difficult. Um, and we, we also have um, already extruded 3D buildings um, experimentally. Mm. So in the far future, we want to write um, SDKs for TypeScript, Android, iOS, Linux, and Windows. Um, so even though you can already include them, there's no proper API in Kotlin and Swift. So you have to write SDKs for all of these languages, which, which is quite a lot of work. Um, we also want to add more 3D features, for example, 3D elevation, and also maybe support these roof shapes in our extruded 3D buildings. Um, so in conclusion, um, we portability was still an unsolved problem or is still an unsolved problem and um, we can conclude basically that MapLibre RS is a new portable map renderer and it solves the problem of portability quite nicely. Um, so for the future of MapLibre RS we basically have these two directions which we could go. So there's on the one hand we might reach want to reach feature parity with other MapLibre renderers for example MapLibre GL native or GLJS. Um, but on the other hand, we have the like contradictory um, goal, which would be to stay in experimental playground, test out new ideas, um, which then also could be implemented, for example, in native um, or GLJS. So if you also love map rendering, feel free to check out uh, Matrix um, or Slack channels. We also have a demonstration available on GitHub. 
uh, which unfortunately right now does not work on any Apple device because Apple has a bug in Safari, we're quite sure. Um, and there's also the block, uh, the block with regular um, updates. Um, and feel free to, to grab the paper with the QR code. Thank you.